The Dystopian Future of America, Central Bank Digital Currencies, Health Passports, and how this all plays in to a social credit score. I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over central bank digital currencies. In the case of the United States, this would be the Fed coin. Most of you know how this works. I'm going to review it quickly, but then at the end, I'm going to go over some additional details that will help us put all the pieces of the puzzle together in step number three and see how this central bank digital currency could tie in to a social score that we have here in the United States, very similar to what China has been doing. But it starts off with our current system. The Fed is over here. It's really removed from the banking system. The Fed doesn't create the dollars that circulate in the real economy on the balance sheet of the non-bank entities. <laughs> Most of you understand how that works. I've done countless videos on it. For those of you who are new to the channel, I'll put links in the description below for videos that will help get you up to speed. But the banking system is really between the Fed and let's say the average Joe. So they are the ones that create the dollars through additional lending. So the bank will loan money to Joe. Those dollars are a liability of a bank. Now all of a sudden they're an asset of Joe, but that loan turns into an asset for the bank. And of course that is a liability for the average Joe. But the main point here is that the banks, the commercial banks are creating the dollars that circulate in the economy. Then Joe spends those dollars on things like groceries, rent, car insurance, buying a house, etc. And the data from those transactions go to the individual bank. You see this every single month on your bank statement. But fortunately, there are hundreds, thousands of banks in the United States. So that data is relatively decentralized. There's average Joes, there's average Janes, there's heroin guys, <laughs> there's Moody the Millennials, all the characters from my videos, they could bank with different institutions. Therefore, those transactions they're doing on a daily basis could go to all these different banks. There isn't one bank that would have all the data in a centralized location. Now let's go over how it would work with a central bank digital currency. The Fed would have a direct relationship to average Joe and the entities in the real economy. They would get around the commercial banking system. They would be able to create loans, therefore control the amount of dollars and maybe more importantly, who gets those dollars and how fast they spend the dollars they're receiving. This goes back to all the videos that I've done on how a central bank digital currency would help the Fed create inflation. Again, we'll put a link in the description to some of those down below. For those of you who are new to the channel, you can get up to speed. But the main point is this relationship between the entities and individuals in the real economy now goes directly to the Fed. I think commercial banks would still exist but they would play more of a supporting role to the Fed. So the Fed is creating the loans. The Fed is creating the dollars. And then those loans would then become an asset on the Fed's balance sheet, just like they were an asset on the commercial bank's balance sheet. But the main point here is the data, because the average Joe and the entities and the individuals in the real economy would now all have bank accounts at the Federal Reserve. So all of their transactions, their rent payments, their school payments, their insurance payments, buying groceries, buying a house, you name it, it would all go to a centralized database with the Fed. But who really controls the Fed at the end of the day? It's the government. So let's say you've been buying a little bit too much beer lately. Ooh, no, 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 no. Government's not going to like that. Or let's say that you decided to buy a gas vehicle instead of an electric vehicle. Hmm. Government's probably not going to like that either. The World 
economic form, definitely not going to like that. And at the end of the day, who is controlling or influencing the politicians, the mainstream narrative, and the corporations? Most likely the global elite. They definitely do not like gas-powered vehicles. And let's say that you've been eating a lot of meat lately. Basically, in the eyes of a lot of politicians and the global elite, if you drive a gas-powered vehicle and you eat a lot of meat, you literally want to destroy humanity because you don't care about climate change whatsoever. And we all know that climate change is going to destroy the human race and the entire globe within 10 years. Just ask AOC. And then let's say after you polish off your steak and drive around in your diesel pickup truck, you decide to buy a gun. Oof, naughty, naughty, naughty. And to make matters even worse, you go out and buy Bitcoin and gold. In this case, in the eyes of many at the government and the global elite, you are really a domestic terrorist. Anyone who drinks beer, drives a gas-powered car, eats meat, owns a gun, buys Bitcoin and gold, really wants to destroy America, wants to destroy the human race. And therefore, if we got rid of this person or isolated them, let's say, it would of course be for the greater good. Step number two, health passports. You guys can fill in the blank right here with the word that you know that <laughs> I'm referring to. Got to keep it YouTube friendly. How do health passports play in to the dystopian future of America? First and foremost, I want you to think through what your vision of a health passport is right now. Every single one of you watching this video right now. I would assume it's something like this. You are here and you are holding your cell phone. And if you have all of your government-approved medications, we'll call them, then this is good. So you get a green star. And if you have a green star, then you can go ahead and go to a restaurant or the gym or the bar, something like that. You can participate in society. But if you don't have all your government-approved medications, then you have been bad, very bad. And therefore, on your cell phone, it would show a red star. And if you have a red star on your cell phone and you try to go to the gym, you try to go to a restaurant, they're not going to serve you. In fact, they won't even let you in the front door. Places like New York City, San Francisco, New Orleans, and I think in the future, we'll see more and more cities that make it illegal for businesses to serve you if you have a red star. I think for most of you, this is your idea of how a health passport would work. But unfortunately, I think you're wrong. What I want to bring to your attention, first and foremost, is something called IOB. And this is per the World Economic Forum. What does IOB stand for? Well, instead of the Internet of Things, it's the Internet of Bodies. And I'm not making this up. Editor, let's go right to the Internet. This is a blog post from the World Economic Forum. The Internet of Bodies is here. This is how it could change our lives. Bullet points, we are entering the era of the Internet of Bodies, collecting our physical data via a range of devices that can be implanted, swallowed, or worn. The result is a huge amount of health-related data that could improve human well-being around the world and prove crucial in fighting the Cervasa sickness pandemic. I want to be as objective as I can here and point out that they do acknowledge the risks to your privacy 
and other practical hurdles, which they address in the article. Now, usually their solution to this is just better regulation. And as long as all the right central planners get your data in real time, then we've got nothing to worry about. So that's why I'm suspicious, to say the least, of them bringing up these challenges, but they're at least bringing them up. So moving down into the article, this is where they point out the deluge of data collected through such technologies is advancing our understanding of how human behavior, lifestyle, and environmental conditions affect our health. It has also expanded the notion of healthcare beyond the hospital or surgery into everyday life. This could prove crucial in fighting the cerveza sickness. Keeping track of symptoms could help us stop and spread the infection and quickly detect new cases. Researchers are investigating whether data gathered from smartwatches and similar devices, such as ingestible microchips, body implants, can be used as viral infection alerts by tracking the user's heart rate and breathing. So whether this is a wearable, something you ingest, according to the World Economic Forum, or an implant, the central planners in real time would be able to determine your temperature. And of course, if you had too high of a temperature, that would give you a red star. And it would be illegal for businesses to serve you or for you to participate in society because you are now a health risk. And we've got to remember, we need to lock you in your house. You need to stay there and not leave because it's for the greater good. But it would also be able to determine your vital signs. So this could be a predictive measure to determine whether or not you have the cerveza sickness. So if your vital signs aren't looking good, it's going to be a red star. Also, it'll determine whether or not you have the approved up-to-date meds from the government. And this would also include your boosters. So if you're not up-to-date on those monthly booster shots and everything that has been mandated by the government, again, that's going to be a red star. But let's think this through. If we're dividing the population between red stars and green stars, and we're giving people green stars based on the government telling us they aren't a health threat, what's going to happen when someone with a green star interacts with someone with a red star? Let's say that you get invited to a party. What are you going to do first? You're going to make sure that everyone at that party has a green star. Let's say you get invited over to your friend's house, over to your sister's house, your mom's house, your father's house. You're going to make sure that they have a green star because if they don't have a green star and you get within proximity, let's say closer than six feet or closer than six miles, who knows, that means that you are going to get a red star because you have been in contact with them. Therefore, you could potentially now be a health risk. Whoa, time out. I know a lot of you right now are watching this and saying that is absolutely impossible. The government can't track where I've been. The government can't determine who I've interacted with. That's crazy talk, George. You're just fear-mongering. Really? Editor, let's cut to a clip of an app called Life360. I also want to 
point out that not only can the app determine where you have been and where you are at all times, but it also can determine whether or not you've been speeding. Maybe you've been texting and driving, or maybe you hit the brakes too hard. Hmm, boy, that is a no-no. You are a risk to society, and therefore, for the greater good, that's going to affect your social score. So the real-time data going to the government not only includes every single one of your transactions, your monetary transactions, financial transactions, through a central bank digital currency, but it'll also most likely include your temperature, vital signs, meds, boosters. It's going to include if you have contacted or been in contact with someone with a red star. And therefore, if you have, it's going to automatically give you another red star until you go through at least a two-week quarantine, according to the government or whatever safety precautions they have in place at the time. But it'll also show if a business has broken the rules and decided to serve you. You see, if it can determine your location at all times, it not only can determine who you've been in contact with, but it also can tell you which entities, which restaurants, which bars you've gone to. And if you went to one of those bars and you have a red star, well, all of a sudden, that bar or that restaurant could potentially be put out of business. So this is what the future might look like. We've got the real economy. We have business XYZ. We have the Fed. We haven't even talked about that. Obviously, when the Fed is giving out UBI through their central bank digital currency, they're only going to give out UBI to the people with green stars. But the people that have been approved by the government they're able to participate in the economy. And the people who have not been approved by the government or haven't done exactly what the government tells them to do, then they get excommunicated from society until which point they do whatever is required by the government to get that green star again. And I want to be very clear, these aren't necessarily predictions. What I'm trying to do is point out how we are on a very slippery slope right now and that the technology and the narrative is out there to take us to this dystopian type of future. So I know right about now your friend and family member Fred is watching this video and saying, George, that is crazy talk. Why are you making such a big deal? out of all of this. Why doesn't everyone just go down and get the required medicines? Then we won't have anything to worry about. In fact, I even drew a character called Conforming Karen. Looks very similar to Moody the Millennial. In fact, I think Karen could be Moody's parent. <laughs> because of course, I don't know Karen's preferred pronouns, but they are sitting right here. And of course, they've got their green star on their phone. They are always pissed off with their blue hair. Therefore, of course, they're giving you the bird and holding a sign saying, I love CNN. But conforming Karen is asking that question over and over and over again. I see them on my social media feed constantly. Again, what's the big deal? Why not just conform? It's just a rule. We have to have rules in order to have a civilized society. Well, how I would respond to your friend and family member Fred, or maybe conforming Karen, is to give them a little history lesson that would show them the dangers of government taking more and more power and taking away more and more of your freedoms. This is a quote from a Hungarian Jew from the documentary, The Last Days. It's obviously a documentary about Germany during the 1930s. People wonder, how is it that we didn't do something? Why didn't we run away? Why didn't we hide? 
Well, things didn't happen all at once. Things happened very slowly. So each time a new law came out, or a new restriction, we said, well, just another thing. It'll blow over. When we had to wear the yellow star to be outside, at that point, we started to worry. So whether it's a yellow star, a green star, or a red star, when government divides society, when they segregate society into different groups, when they make it illegal for businesses to serve certain groups in society, it never ends well. Step number three, the social credit score and why I think there's a good probability that this is part of a dystopian future for America. In step number one, we talked about how the central bank digital currency will give the central planners all of your financial data as far as the transactions you're doing day to day in real time. This will feed directly into your credit score. So if you buy something that isn't approved or you buy too much of it, that's going to take your score down to a level that could prevent you from participating in society. It could mean that you don't get that mortgage or if you do, it's a much higher interest rate. It could mean that your kid isn't allowed to go to that specific school or university or maybe they're not allowed to play in any sports or after school activities. Why? Because you and your family are just too dangerous. And for the greater good, we need to protect society from domestic terrorists like you. Your health passport that we talked about in step number two also feeds into your social credit score. If you have that red star, or if you've been in contact with someone with a red star, or if you're a business that has actually served one of the red stars, then your social score will definitely take a hit. But when we think through the probabilities of the U.S. going in this direction, going further down the road to serfdom, to a point where we live in a totalitarian police state. It all starts, in my opinion, with thinking through the book from Neil Howe, The Fourth Turning. I want to go to a clip, a very short clip, that gives you Neil's take on the last four generations. Pay very specific attention to the last generation which is basically Gen Z. I think he calls it the Homelander generation, but it's the same thing as Gen Z. These are kids who were born after 2000. These are the individuals that will be making up the future adults. They're coming of age now. They're going into the workforce. They're sophisticated with social media, and they have attitudes towards freedom that are far, far different than what you and I were raised with. The key that Neil points out here is they were very overprotected when they were raised. Therefore, the majority of them, I don't want to throw everyone under the bus here, but the majority of them as a whole will prefer safety or value safety far more than they'll value freedom. Editor, let's cut to the clip. Profits grow up as increasingly indulged post-crisis children come of age as the narcissistic young crusaders of the awakening. These individuals become moralistic midlifers, emerge as the wise elders guiding the next crisis. The most recent example is the baby boomer generation. Nomads grow up as underprotected children during an awakening, coming of age as the alienated young adults of a post-awakening world. These individuals mellow into pragmatic midlife leaders during a crisis and age into tough post-crisis elders. The most recent example is Generation X. Heroes grow up as increasingly protected post-awakening children coming of age as the heroic young team workers of a crisis. Heroes demonstrate hubris as energetic midlifers and emerge as powerful elders attacked by the next awakening. 
The most recent example is the millennial generation. Artists grow up as overprotected children during a crisis, come of age as the sensible young adults of a post-crisis world. Artists eventually break free as indecisive midlife leaders during an awakening and age into empathic post-awakening elders. The most recent example is the Homelander generation. So we use the fourth turning as a starting point to determine the probabilities that we have this social credit score and it plays a big role in the dystopian future of America. But we need to take it a step further. It's not just the fact that there's a generation and a lot of Americans that value safety more than they value freedom, but it's also how they dealt with authority when they were being raised. More specifically, how they dealt with conflict and how they used authority when they were growing up in school. To get more insight here, let's go to a recent interview from the author of the book titled The Coddling of the American Mind. His name is Jonathan Haidt. We've got to break that cycle because this is likely to stay with people for life. As their brains are developing at puberty, That's the it's a very plastic time. It's mm -hmm. a time when neurons will get set in patterns more. So we have to, I think, especially focusing on elementary schools and middle schools, elementary schools, kids have to have a lot more time playing unsupervised. So it's getting social media in middle school and possibly even bigger is the loss of vast amounts of unsupervised free play when kids learn to work out conflicts on their own without appealing to an adult. What we've done because of our fear of abduction, we've kept them always supervised. And because of our fear of bullying, we always have someone there to resolve disputes. And we tell them, you know, he, you know, go, if, if you're, if you see something, say something, go to an adult. And so kids get very, very practiced in how to make their case in the most powerful way to win with the adult. Mm. And that's what, that's, that's what this wave of kids did beginning in 2013. It wasn't just that they found everything threatening. So we have this generation. And I want to be fair, it's not just them, and it's not all of them. It would include a lot of Americans that are in all generations. But just broadly speaking, we have this generation that values safety more than they value freedom. Instead of settling conflicts on their own, they always went to the authority figure to settle those conflicts for them. So how do we see this playing out in the real world? To understand this better, let's go to a clip from a YouTuber who is wildly popular. In fact, many young people and older people go to him specifically for their news. His name is Philip DeFranco. And I don't know Phil at all. And I watched a few of his videos and just not my cup of tea <laughs> as far as what he talks about. He's talking about everything from the Kardashians to uh, OnlyFans. It's, it's not really what I get into. But there was a clip that I saw that really sheds light and illustrates perfectly the attitude of this younger generation when they see someone with a dissenting view. They see this person as dangerous and someone that needs to be controlled and needs to be crushed. Editor, let's cut to the clip. With a man then going on to make similar comments to people coming to the woman's defense, getting in their faces, also telling them to sit the fuck down. With the video going viral, we saw the backlash growing, the anger growing, even the acting head of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority calling the guy a jerk. This also resulted in a number of people working to identify him, including a number of TikTokers who were known for reporting these kinds of terrible people to their workplaces or other groups that they're associated with. Eventually with this situation, we saw TikToker Savannah Sparks identifying him as 27-year-old Ryan Bartles, saying that she also found his mom and sister and told them about his behavior. Also at some point saying that he worked at CarMax in Virginia, so she reached out to them in case he was still employed. After that, CarMax actually made a statement saying that he wasn't an employee. But then after pushback from Internet Salusa claimed to have found information suggesting otherwise, CarMax clarified that he has not worked for the company since May of this year. But to be clear, as of right now, Bartles has not made a statement confirming or denying whether it is or is not him, though his LinkedIn page has been deleted. And now as the story has grown, more people getting involved, they're saying that he also attended an anti-vax mandate rally 
in New York City the same day that he acted out on the subway. But main point to the guy in this video, go fuck yourself. You're a trash person doing trash things and you belong in the dump. Who gets in the face of and yells at and tries to intimidate an old lady because she wants you to just please do the bare minimum. She's like literally in the group that we're most trying to protect. But hey, ultimately that's why you are our douchebag of the day. Now, was the guy in this video being a jerk? Maybe. I wasn't there. But even if he was being a D-bag, as Mr. DeFranco refers to him, does he really deserve to have his life ruined? Does he deserve to be fired? Does he deserve to have his livelihood taken away? Is that where we are in society right now? Where every single person we deem as a quote-unquote jerk, needs to have their life destroyed. They need to be crushed by the mob on social media. That in and of itself is far more dangerous, in my opinion, than just not wearing a mask on a subway. And you'll also notice that they put in there that the gentleman just got done attending an anti, we'll call it medicine, mandate rally, implying that Anybody that has that belief system or stands up for the values of our founding fathers automatically falls into that category as someone who is dangerous and deserves to be doxxed. And I want to be very clear. I'm not here to pick on Mr. DeFranco at all. I don't know him. <laughs> he could be a libertarian standing up for freedom. But I'm just using his channel because it is so popular and I think it illustrates the mainstream view that if someone does something that's unsafe, if they get out of line, then there is a mob that needs to go after them to make sure their life and their livelihood is ruined. A perfect setup for a society where a government-issued social score would not only be possible, but would be welcomed. So if we get a central bank digital currency, health passports, and this social score, it boils down to one thing and one thing only, a loss of freedom. But what is the end game if we continue to lose the freedom that we've enjoyed in this country for so many years? To get a clear picture on what history teaches us about societies who prefer safety over freedom. Let's go to a recent interview that I had with the sovereign man himself, my good buddy, Simon Black. Looking at this through the lens of history, if you had to give a quick elevator pitch to someone on why freedom is more important than security or why it should be prioritized over security, what would you tell them? I think if you go back and you look at uh, the history of empire, uh, literally across all of human history, going back to, uh, you can go back to the ancient Sumeria, um, and you look at the fall of empire, um, there are only a handful of reasons for it, uh, very, very few reasons for it. Um, occasionally, you'll find an instant disaster, uh, you know, whatever, major earthquake or, or you know something like that. But for the most part, what we find is that major civilizations, great powers tend to fall because of an erosion of freedom. Hmm. It's not because of security. It's not because of any of these other things. It's because of an erosion of freedom, because they make it more difficult for people to live their lives. They make it more difficult for people to be productive. They make it more difficult for people to save. It's economic freedom. It's individual liberty, all these things. This is ultimately what causes the decline of empire. We can see this over and over and over again. Again, it's not always the case. Sometimes you've got, uh, you know, what I call single person empires, the Mongolians under Genghis, uh, the Macedonians under Alexander, et cetera. You've got the, the one leader that dies and within a generation or two, it's kaput. But for the most part, and we can see this, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the, the French, the Ottomans, the Romans, there's so many examples of this, that the great powers fall because of an erosion of freedom. And mm -hmm. so be careful what you ask for. That's the lesson. That is one of the most fundamental lessons of history. Be careful what you ask for. 
So the bottom line is a society that chooses safety above freedom may temporarily get the safety they desire. But in the long run, the economy and society as a whole will collapse. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out-of-control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here. I will see you on the next video.